Latter-day Peace Studies is produced by peace-loving members of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Any views expressed herein are not to be taken as official positions of the Church or its authorities. Latter-day Peace Studies presents Come Follow Me. I'm Shiloh Logan. And I'm Ben Peterson. Thank you for joining us as we discuss this week's reading of Come Follow Me, as outlined by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We're recording these podcasts from our homes, and so you'll often hear children playing, dogs barking, and babies crying. This is our life, and we love it. Our hope is that as we discuss these scriptures and truths, we will come to a more perfect understanding through experiencing the Atonement of Jesus Christ and find greater peace in our lives. Well, Christopher, I'm back, and now you're co-hosting for Ben. It's good to be with you, Shiloh. (laughs) It's good to be with you too. Well, thank you for standing in for uh, for me for those last two weeks. I had finals and I was working. Uh, I was working a long time. I was, I was eighty ninety hour weeks. You know, reading and it, it's those kinds of things where you are. If you're not completely busy reading something, you're thinking about what you're reading, and so you can just kind of sit down there. And even when you're not trying to think about anything, you're still thinking about it. So anyway, I knew I wasn't going to be able to put my whole heart, might, mind, and strength into it as we will talk about later, but uh, but <laughs> thank you for filling in for me. And now Ben is on a family vacation for the next two weeks, and so it'll work out. So thank you so much. My pleasure. So on this, we are covering sections 58 through 59 today. Man, there's just so much that <laughs> in these sections, we were kind of counting up the different uh, segments of things we could talk about. And I, I don't know how we're going to keep it into time, but we're going to do our best to keep it into time. Our, uh, our poor editors, Kyle and Catherine, thank you so much for everything you do. You know, getting into these, section 58, we have Joseph Smith, who is in Jackson County. You know, he's he's actually gone down to Jackson County. It's August of 1831. He received section 58, and then we get into the next section here, which is just six days later, he ends up having the second revelation. As we've talked about before, the Doctrine and Covenants are this these wonderful set of scripture because... We have to recognize these saints had no identity. They were only a year and a few months into this brand new church. While there were some cultural and religious and other things going on where the early Latter-day Saints were talking about things that other churches had been talking about, and so there was like this fellowship of conversation, what it actually meant to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which was not actually even called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints until 1838, but what it meant to be this Mormon, this this new member of this church with prophetic revelation and, and things, it was brand new. And so now we have, when we look at these revelations, we have to ask ourselves, why was this given? Why was it necessary for this to be given? And so partly, when we start to read section 58 here, we start getting into this idea, and I know, Christopher, you're going to have a lot to say about this, and so am I, but it is about identity. And how do you form identity? Uh, How do we do it as in a religious body with our church? How do we do it as a political body? How do we do it with groups, like sports teams? Everybody has an identity to a sports team. How is that created? And how do we have other identities that we have to any any group at all? How is that formed? And, you know, there's a lot of reasons, and we're going to talk just about a couple of them. But getting into the, the text here, we're going to read, I'm going to read here verse three through six. This is the Lord speaking, and he's talking to the elders of the church, and he's talking about to the Lord saying, hey, keep my commandments. It's a common theme. You cannot behold with your natural eyes, he says, for the present time, the design of your God. Concerning these things which shall come hereafter, and the glory which shall follow after much tribulation. For after much tribulation come the blessings. Wherefore the day cometh that ye shall be crowned with much glory, but the hour is not yet, but is nigh at hand. Remember this, which I tell you before, that ye may lay it in your heart, and receive that which is to follow. Behold, verily I say unto you, for this cause have I sent to you, that you might be obedient, and that your hearts might be prepared to hear the testimony of the things which are to come. All right, Christopher, let's unpack this. So let's talk about some suffering and sacrifice narratives. All right. Okay, so... It's story time. Story time. <laughs> well, that's the that's my answer to your question, right? I know it was a rhetorical question, but how do we create identity? And you left out political parties. Oh, political parties. Yeah, right? same thing. Yeah. Yeah, and it's stories. 
And of course, there's some, there's usually some event, you know, we can say that there's this causal event that is the one that prompts us to either revise our current story or to come up with a new story. So what do you mean by story? In someone who has never studied any of this before, and they're coming into saying, how do we form identity? And someone says, through stories. What does that even mean? What do you mean when you say that? Well, I mean, the stories we tell ourselves about who we are and how we became who we are. This is really the point of scripture. This is why Genesis. This is why Hesiod's Theogony and Works and Days. This is why the Mesopotamian myths, creation myths that even the Genesis was modeled on. All of scripture has have stories, and it's also in poetry. I should say other poetry, since a lot of scripture is poetry. It's in the Aeneid, is the story of how the Romans became the Romans. And how do those stories affect us? I mean, what's going on here with the stories here? You know, we, we talk about this whole tribulation. After the tribulations coming the blessings, what do you think, what do you think that's talking about? And how does a story fit into that kind of, uh, that kind of formation of identity? Well, here we're talking about the story of sacrifice, of making things sacred, right? That's part of every religious story is making things sacred. Sacrus facere, to sacrifice. When I first started getting into this conversation about, about suffering and sacrifice narratives, I was curious because I come from a nonviolence background and kind of from a pacifist background. And I was fascinated by the phenomenon, but by the human phenomenon of parents who would willingly send their children at the behest of the state to go into foreign lands to to engage in the a military operation and to kill other people and to be killed and and to have that uh, that possibility become an actuality and how can how can a state script a narrative that would not only have a parent be willing to have their child go overseas and to be killed, but that, number one, they would be ashamed or or have some kind of negative emotion if their child did not go. And if their child died, for them to be able to feel a certain amount of honor and of, and of, uh, you know, courage and, and, and other virtues and have other virtues associated to this. And I was, I was fascinated by how this story was told. And I was reading a book by Stanley Haberwas, who's, uh, who's, who's an academic. And one of the books that he was talking about, he got into the suffering sacrifice narratives. And, and that led me into, you know, Carl Jung and some other people. And, and, you know, we were talking about Bernays and his book on propaganda. And he was, he was what the son, it was not a son-in-law. He was the nephew of, of Freud, right? That's right. And so how this works out is that in our lives, we all experience moments of trauma. And in our trauma, the human mind, the human psyche is looking for ways to be able to make sense out of this. What, what, to explain it. Yeah, to explain it. Why did this happen? Everything happens for a reason. Yeah, that's I, I, it's that it's that impulse, right? And even if it doesn't, the brain wants to wants to come up with a reason for it anyway. Well, I meant that's the story, right? The story is that everything happens for a reason. <laughs> right. Yeah, there you go. There's more to this story that, that you were mentioning about the the going and fighting and dying, because I was going to add to it, and for no good reason. But see, then that's the crux of the matter, because the people who are doing, who are willing to do this, and by the way, the person, it's not just the parents, the, the person who's going to fight himself or herself has to also feel like they they should go and fight, and they should risk their life and, and be willing to die. And as a matter of fact, they would be ashamed not to. And even Private Desmond Doss of Hacksaw Ridge Renown, you know, the film that was based on his experience. He's a pacifist and he and yet he he feels like he has to go and do his duty, which, you know, he did by not by fighting, but by saving lives as a as a medic who wouldn't even carry a weapon. But in telling ourselves these stories or in being willing to go and fight, there is a story about why it is for a good reason. And here's where propaganda comes into play, right? Because the state has to have some kind of good reason to tell you. And by the way, they may not have to do that much because your so-called education, or rather your schooling, can also be a part of that propaganda. And so you're already predisposed toward this idea of sacrificing for the state. 
And again, when I say sacrificing, well, now you have, because look at that, that's, that's the state that you're sacrificing for. And I'm, I'm using the word sacrificing. And it's the same with religion. And that's where it, that's where it comes from. And in today's world, we have a sacralization of the secular or a sacralization of the state, I should say. Right? There's this idea of the cult of the state. And the state has all of the same parts as religion. And that's interesting. It is interesting. It is interesting because they do. They borrow a lot of the way that the religious institutions and the state, they borrow a lot of the same ideas and principles. And it, I don't even know if it's conscious in most of the cases. It is very conscious in, at least in the state version of it, because we have Edward Bernays who ends up writing the book Propaganda. I mean, <laughs> he was the one through World War II who was actually hired and wrote a book about how to write propaganda to do this very thing. So this is not a, a matter of just p- piecing things together here and there haphazardly, but th- this is actually a researched st- and studied thing about how to, you know, manipulate has a negative connotation and Bernays doesn't give a, a negative connotation. He thinks what he's doing is very moral and un- highbrow. And so he's not going to use manipulation, but it is how to, you know, if we want to go as far as persuade, but how do we get the individual to form identity to the state so that they will give up one thing of value for something of greater value? Or to a product. Or to a product, right? right? Yeah, or to a product because it's used in, in advertising. As a matter of fact, in Spanish, we still call the commercials, commercials are called propaganda. Propagandas are in the plural, propagandas. Las propagandas, the ones that are in, you know, that come on during your show. You know, and it's interesting because Bernays, you know, we, we say it's moral. The problem is that the Nazis took his ideas and applied them. And so after World War II, we don't say propaganda anymore for what Bernays was talking about. We call it PR. Right. But it's the same playbook, the book being propaganda by Edward Bernays. Right. It's the exact same principle there. This is just one of those things that human beings naturally act this way. And we naturally work in this way to where when we experience trauma and we're trying to make sense out of it, then what happens is we end up creating something that has greater meaning to us than the trauma we experienced. Something that either gives us a why for why we experienced trauma, or it gives us something that we can grasp onto. And so, as far as the statecraft is concerned, you know, this you know, they'll they'll say that there's a virtue, or that there is a you know, dying for freedom, or dying for an ideal, or dying for something greater than self. And so, all of a sudden, you've made something and you've placed something of greater pri- priority and primacy than the the individual self. And so, that's why they sacrifice. You know, you reminded me of of Viktor Frankl, the author of *Man's Search for Meaning*, the Auschwitz survival. A sur- a sur- survivor, the Auschwitz survivor, who is who was a psychologist himself and the the creator of logotherapy, he said, to live is to suffer. To survive is to find meaning in the suffering. And I think that quote encapsulates exactly what we're talking about here, doesn't it? Yes, that's exactly what we're talking about. It's this idea that life just is suffering. Things just are. Uh, things don't go our way. And as he says, though, and this is the psychologist, at least this psychologist's point of view, that we have to create a story to tell us why we're suffering and why it's worth it. And he says, you know, you can, anyone can live with any what as long as they have a why. Yes. The why is the, the question that gives us our meaning in life. The thing that gives it most of us used to flavor all of our lives. We can go through this whole life without tasting anything and without, and with just having feasting on the drab, as it were, but until we're able to, to actually add flavor to life. And that's where meaning comes from. It's, just, it's the whole thing that gives the spice to it. And when we don't have that, we don't have the why, everything else just kind of falls apart. And, and this gets you, there's a lot of marketers, Simon Sinek, you know, he comes out and he, he says, he has a book, Start With The Why, even from a marketing agent, you know, marketing and business perspective. Most businesses that fail start with the how, and then they work their way to a why. But those that start with the why and work their way out to a how are usually far, far more successful. And so it's just the natural human way that we do these things. So when I read verse four... And sorry, and of course, that's a human creation and you can do that. We're not human creations, we're God's creations. And so the, the what is just going to happen according to how the cosmos is organized. 
how, how, how the cosmos is organized. So then what we need is the answer to the question why, and it's in answering that question why that we tell ourselves stories. Yes. Stories are how we answer the question why. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. That's the way to bring it back full circle. So in verse four, when it says, for after much tribulation come the blessings, that's why. Because when we go into those moments of trauma and we create the why and the stories of why this is happening, the natural human progression is that we come out the other end trying to heal from that trauma with a greater meaning than we went into it. And so it gives an answer to a lot of these cases as to why people transcend into these moments of trauma and traumatic and the traumatic, and then they come out having greater solidification in thing, or if their why is strong enough, that's when they're, they're, they usually have a story that solidified that why in their lives. And we're going to find that with the saints as we keep on talking about their Missouri persecutions, because we're going to have Joseph Smith, who doesn't have a firm why. He cries out and he's like, Lord, he's like, where art thou? And where's the prevailing that covereth thy hiding place? You know, he's, he, he's asking a, a why question. He's like, why, why have you abandoned us, as it were? And so the Lord's response is going to, is powerful. Now, we're not going to talk about that to, today, but. I love how you turned his how question, or what was the question he asked? It's a how question, right? But you turned it into a why question because that's ultimately what it analyzes down to, right? Is why have you abandoned us? So just because we hear a, a how question or another question word doesn't mean it's not still a why question. Yeah. And so that's what we, whenever we're going through trauma in our own lives, for my own experience, it's always been to get down to the why. And why is what pulls me out. And sometimes it's hard to find the why. And so that, that's always been very therapeutic. Later in my life and more, and more recently in the last few years, I've been exploring with different ways of, of experiencing life that try to I, circumvent isn't the right word, but it's trying to give up the, the necessity for the meaning, but to simply accept it for what it is, that, that reality is reality and that this is just the way that it is. But you know, that isn't itself a why reality is just reality. That's why there's even a step I find be, be beyond that, that I've even found in certain elements of Buddhism and studying Buddhism where they tried to kind of let go of even the why. And, and it, it, gets, it gets really trippy really fast. But I think for at least for this conversation to be able to understand the bedrock concepts of these narratives about how we establish our identities, because then once we have experienced trauma and we have a reason for the trauma and we've been able to transcend is one way of looking at it, but move past it is another way of looking at it. It solidifies our identity and our connection to why that trauma happened. When you say reality is what it is, it just is. This is ultimately the same thing as answering the question, why is there something rather than nothing? You and I both studied philosophy. Why is there something rather than nothing is a nonsensical question because it just is. And if there wouldn't be, then there wouldn't be anybody to ask the question, right? Yeah. It, it just is. There just is something, and that's why we're here asking this nonsensical question <laughs> or recognizing it as such and, and not trying to answer it. But we do. We try to answer this question that doesn't have really an answer, metaphysically speaking at least, but we want to tell ourselves a story epistemologically that makes the suffering worthwhile. The next section here, we have in verses 19 through 23, now, Christopher, you and I have talked about this. How long we've known each other for over ten years now, and we've <laughs> we've talked about this these uh, these scriptures quite a bit. For verily I say unto you, my law shall be kept on this land. So, verse nineteen: Let no man think he is ruler, but let God rule him that judgeth according to the counsel of his own will. Or, in other words, him that counseleth or sitteth upon the judgment seat. Let no man break the laws of the land, for he that keepeth the laws of God hath no need to break the laws of the land. Wherefore, be subject to the powers that be, and tell he who reigns whose right it is to reign, and subdue all of his enemies under his feet. For behold, the laws which have ye have received from my hand are the laws of the church, and in this light ye shall hold them forth. Behold, here is wisdom. Man, there's a lot to unpack there. Yes. <laughs> you know, one thing I saw, the first thing I saw you have, it looks like Dante, when he's writing about, and this is after Augustine, I, I remember you said something, you mentioned Augustine before recording City of God, but it reminds me of Dante's monarchy where he's writing 
to make the case for the separation of that which is, you know, that which has to do with the, the soul to the church and that which has to do with the body to the state. Yes. And, and it's the same thing that, uh, the same idea that Luther picks up on when Luther starts to, to talk about his, his own ideas and the separations that the, the church, the government controls the body, whereas the church controls the soul and the government shouldn't try to control the soul as it were. Yeah. Those, those ideas, those ideas are, are they're pretty old. <laughs> they're, they're not new. And let's not forget that we might be able to call Dante a Neoplatonist perhaps, but with, with Augustine, let's not forget that Augustine and, and Luther are Platonists. And, Oh, how interesting. I was going to say this about Luther, but I think actually Augustine is the other one. So those two, they just both came up, right? Those two have done more to pervert theology than any other thinkers I can think of, at least. Yeah, it, that is definitely a running a running argument. And I know, especially in the church, there are a lot of people who have said that Luther has done more to be able to progress the advancement of the gospel. And I know that people have argued the opposite. Well, there's no doubt that that the Reformation may have had some influence in moving things forward away from whatever corruption there was at the at, at the time in the Church Catholic, right? But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the the perversion of the theology, and it's interesting too because we we actually have much more in common with Catholics as Latter Day Saints than we do with Protestants, and I think that's largely misunderstood. And it could be. It could be Bruce R. McConkie's fault, right? <laughs> With his idea that the that the Catholic Church is the great and abominable church, which of course was stricken from his book, the one that he published under the title Mormon Doctrine that the church told him he couldn't call that because it wasn't Mormon doctrine. Yeah, they had to do a bunch of rev- revisions to it. And, and that was really a popular idea to look at the Catholic Church as the great and abominable church. And that was really something that came to being specifically from the anti-Catholic bent really with the rise of modern Mormonism. And uh, modern Mormonism, that's a, a, a term that's rather coined by Greg Prince. He wrote, an, he wrote a biography, or the biography of David O. McKay, and, and he called it the rise of modern Mormonism. But after David O. McKay, there was this significant shift in the way that the church operated and correlation started and America became, or the church became a little bit more a kind of American corporate and Canada took on an American corporate style and an aesthetic. And so we have this white shirts and all, right? White shirts and all, right. And, you know, clean, clean, clean shaven faces and, and the whole, the whole nine yards. IBM style. Yeah. You know, there's actually a good segue here. If we want to go into how we interpret this section or this part of this section against other sections like 98 and what are the other sections? We talked about this pre-recording. Those sections that have to do with the relationship between the man and the state and the laws and the constitutionality, this this thought gets further refined. The thought that we see here uh, revealed is further defined. And, you know, we have a good segue is because with along with David O. McKay, there was Ezra Taft Benson. Right. Yeah, we have a lot of shifting. So section 58, these verses right here, when we talk about government and the church's relationship to government, section 58 is really the first revelation that we have that starts to talk about government. And there's a few things that pop up here and there, but this is where the foundation is laid. Let no man break the laws of the land, for he that keepeth the laws of God hath no need to break the laws of the land. Before this, we had had moments when the Lord had told him to go purchase lands and to obey, you know, and to follow the law that way and to, and to try to do things according to the law in a certain manner. But this is the first time we get a general principle of how God is interacting with it. And so one of the things we look at this with in section 58 is that God is the one who is directing the saints to be subjective to the state. That the saints don't have any natural obligation to the state. What they have is an obligation to the state because God told them to. And this is different than anything else that's happened before, any philosophy that's really come about before. Even coming back to Luther or Augustine, coming back to these people who are talking about these two different views, they usually take an egocentric or, or the person as the center of the conversation and posit them as the center of the conversation, that they have the the physical world that they interact with the state, and they have the spiritual world that they interact with the church. And so it's all very egocentric. But in this, now we're taking a God-centric 
way of talking about it, that God's the one who's t- telling them that their identity is primarily with him, and he's the one who's telling them to go and to be subservient to the, to the laws. And in doing so, that they're not going to break his laws if they adhere to these laws. Now, if we fast forward two years, we're going to get into section 98. And so in 1833, the Lord comes out and he clarifies in section 98 what he means by the laws of the land. And what that what he talks about there a little bit is he says that he justifies us and the, the members of the church to befriend the, the law of the land, which is the constitutional law of the land. And then he defines what is constitutional by any law that will support the rights and privileges that belong to all mankind. And this is where we get the talk from uh, President Benson, Ezra Taft Benson, on the proper role of government, right? Yeah. So section 98, it's going to be section 98 and 134 that we get the proper role of government from, from Ezra Taft Benson. Because with section 98, section 98 is the very first section, a revelation rather, that gives an implied justification for civil disobedience. Right. And so civil disobedience is a very hot topic among, you know, religious studies and and political studies and that, that religio political discussion because it gets into the conversation of when is it when is an, a, a law an unjust law under the scheme of a god that exists. So if a god exists where there's objective universal morality and there's an there's an objective unjust law, then what is a Christian to do? Right, there's the idea of of just law or, or of natural law. Sorry, and when you say if there is there an unjust law, this takes us all the way back to Augustine, who said lex in justa non est lex. An unjust law is not a law at all. Yeah, it, it's acted as though that if if a law is put onto the books, and it can it can be created by Congress and then signed by the president, and 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 the Supreme Court looks at it, and a case comes up, and they and they uphold it, and everything is good. It can still be an unconstitutional law according to what section 98 says. That right. because if the saints or God says, no, 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 that law is unconstitutional because it does not support the rights and privileges of all mankind. In, in what way would you say that, this, that these ideas have been misinterpreted or misused? I think the saints nowadays, we live under a completely different way of looking at these scriptures, and they were radically changed by really the first time, as I've been able to study it, by the first manifesto with Wilford Woodruff. Because what happened is, is in section 98, you had this idea coming about that God says that if a law is constitutional that supports the rights and privileges of all people, then it's justified and to be, be supported. But anything that was more or less than that, it's it says in section 98, is evil and we should abandon all evil and forsake all evil is the way that it's phrased in verse 11. And so what that's the the implied backdoor to be able to have a justification for civil disobedience. Whereas what we did instead, right, is instead of abandoning all evil, we abandon our plural wives. Well, is it fair to put it that way? Um yes. I, and that can be because what happens is in section 134, 134 is not a revelation. It was actually a a a declaration and a statement on the church's position about politics and it was written by Oliver Cowdery when Joseph Smith was out of town. Away. He was yeah. away. So he came back in Oliver Cowdery and they, the church had already voted on it, ratified on it, and it adopted it. And Joseph looked over it and he's like, I don't see anything wrong with this. But it's in section, it's okay. in verse five of section 134 that says that sedition and rebellion are unbecoming every citizen thus protected in their inherent and inalienable rights. And it's that little phrase, thus protected which ends up creating and kind of solidifying this idea of civil disobedience because what happens if the saints are not upheld in their inherent and inalienable rights? Then is, is sedition and rebellion okay? And it's never answered in section 134, but we actually see it lived by the saints because of plural marriage. Even after the United States passed the law against plural marriage, they still kept practicing it. Well, until they didn't, until they actually capitulated to the state. Right. And another thing, in Section 98, we actually get more than what we've been talking about here, right? In terms of you don't just fly off the handle, right? There's there's a lot of patience and forbearance that, that we're taught in Section 98 when it comes to injustice, Right. Yes. So section 98 is also the section that talks about war and about how to turn the other cheek. One of the most beautiful sections about of, uh, of revelation and of God coming down and telling his people a divine ethic 
about being attacked. And, and we covered this in, if anybody's interested in this, we covered this, Ben and I, pretty, really extensively in the war chapters, in the first war chapters podcast. If you go back with Come Follow Me back into the last year's podcast, we did a two section podcast on the war chapters. And so the first section there goes into the whole theory about war and about turning the other cheek and in kind of a, a Sermon on the Mount Christ centric message that is talked about in section 98. Yeah. But when we go back over to uh, Wilford Woodruff, the, the official de- declaration, if you read it, he doesn't invoke any of this. In fact, God is not even mentioned in the official declaration. The, what it is, is that he says that whereas the, the country has enacted the law and the Supreme Court has upheld it, now it's constitutional. So when you look at it from a legal theory perspective, what happened is the church for the last 60, you know, 50 years or so, you know, 50, 60 years, had upheld a natural law perspective. Like you said, Lex and Weston, non est Lex, an unjust law is no law at all. And they went in and, and he adhered to what's called a legal positivist point of view. And what that means is that if the law is unjust, it's still a law. It still has power and authority and the state can still do what it wants to do and we should still follow it. But what legal positivism says is that we should use the proper channels of government to try to change the law from the inside out. Right. And so here's where we lost some of the people who wanted to keep, let's say, that natural law point of view and their plural wives and they break off from the church. And then the rest of us are taught that we should actually still do as it says all the way back here in the section that we're discussing this week in 58 and follow the laws of the land, right? And of course, work to change them through the through the proper channels and, and systems. And yet we still seem to have many uh, who have not left us who hold on to the other way of thinking about it, right? Yeah, there's there's it's highly complex too, because in our modern, the way that is talked about today, especially from President Oaks, is President Oaks has very much positioned a, a kind of a legal positivist point of view on this particular issue, where he talks about changing things basically from the inside. That if there's a law that we don't like, we're going to we're going to work from the inside to change it and to be able to do things through the legal pro- due process. Whereas the church before w- Wilford Woodruff was, well, I don't care what the government says; it's not a just law. We're not going to follow it. There's no there's no command by divine God or anything. And, and there's so many quotes from the general authorities through that time that it, it establishes the principle really, really strong that that's how they they viewed and adhered to it. But within we get down to modern Mormonism, you know, Ezra Taft Benson ends up having this public speech in 1968, I think, I think it was a BYU address, where it's dubbed the proper role of government. And he goes back to section section 134, and he starts to express kind of trying to resurrect that old idea of uh, kind of pre-Wilford Woodruff, but also at the same time, President Benson, it's arguable, it's very arguable that he was in a minority of the Brethren, that the Brethren did not adhere to the same politics and the same belief in in the proper rule of government and in kind of the constitution that, that President Benson, or Elder Benson at the time, adhered to. Yeah, you're talking about a really interesting period in history, right? You and I have both both in master's programs, started to write about this and abandoned it, right? <laughs> but but we've talked about it a lot. We've read a lot about it. I can remember the summer that I spent holed up in a condo in Park City reading about this and talking with you and visiting and, and ended up abandoning it after that and writing on the philosophical presuppositions of totalitarianism instead for my master's thesis or my honors thesis. You know, but th- there's this idea that, well, not, not this idea, there's this historical fact that is that the general authorities themselves were sniping each other across the pulpit. And we have documentation <laughs> of this. Yeah. And the idea that, that they were, that, that some were saying that Benson was doing what he was doing at the behest of David O. McKay because David O. McKay was senile. Otherwise, he would not actually, he doesn't really know what Benson is doing, right? This is interesting stuff. Yeah. It, it you know, and so there's a lot of times that uh, McKay doesn't really know how to handle uh, Elder Benson. And so there, right. there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of like, how, how do, how do we, how do we rein this in and how do we redirect it for different ways? Yeah, it's, it gets really complicated really fast. And then we also have President McKay who agreed with a lot of Benson's anti-communist rhetoric. The first presidency sent out many uh, anti-communist statements. And 
At any rate, the whole reason for this discussion is to show that our interpretation of Section 58 about this whole let no man break the laws of the land has changed over time. That the way that we're taught this Section 58 is not the way it's always been taught. If you would have asked the saints from 1850 to 1890 how to interpret this, they would have given you a completely different way to interpret this than, than we do now. But that's, that's fine. And the way that, uh, the way that this has evolved, I don't have any, I don't have any problem with it. It's the way. In some sense, we're back to the, the, the original understanding, I think. The idea that we should follow the law. Yeah, we're going back to just following. Plain and simple. Just plain and simple, following the law. And there might come a time where a section 98 with a kind of an implicit civil disobedience back door ends up making its way back into kind of over the pulpit discussions. I doubt it. I, I don't see that ever really coming up. We, you know, we've pretty much taken a really cemented stance in the church affecting and, and really putting its weight behind certain policies that it feels passionate about. And, and then once the law goes sideways or doesn't follow the way that the church had supported, the church just kind of fought, fought, tries to then carve out a niche with whatever has been created that it can still do what it does and exist in that. And, you know, right. we saw that with the, the whole Prop 8 in 2008 in California with the, with the marriage amendment. And as that finally got to the Supreme Court and was tossed out as unconstitutional, then the church did what the church does. And it just amended it and started to create and carve out different, uh, different places and spheres for itself legally. So, but moving on to section, uh, to verses 26, this is another thing that President Benson talked a lot about. I know these verses really well because I used to read President Benson. Um, as a child, a lot. And so this, For behold, it is not meet that I should command in all things. For he that is compelled in all things, the same is slothful and not a wise servant. Wherefore, he receiveth no reward. Verily I say unto you, men should be anxiously engaged in a good cause and do many things of their own free will and will bring to pass much righteousness. For the power is in them wherein they are agents unto themselves. And inasmuch as men do good, they shall in no rise lose their reward. But he that doeth not anything until he is commanded, and receiveth a commandment with doubtful heart, and keepeth it with slothful, the same is damned. All, all the way up until being damned, that was really inspiring. Right. <laughs> and, and actually, I'd like to go into damned a little bit and see if we can maybe come to understand it in a way that it doesn't actually land the way it does where you oh i'm really inspired and all of a sudden oh of course i i don't have to worry about being damned if i'm doing the things right but in the end what does it really mean to be damned is it is it god is going to zap us if we don't do these things or or can we understand that in a different way i think that's the conversation we want to have right yeah totally yeah go for it what uh so what are some of your i have a lot of thoughts on this what are some of your thoughts on it to me the the face value uh observation is uh, that is for me, right? If you already, if you don't have the idea that God wants to zap you, then just as virtue is its own reward, having to be commanded and being slothful and not doing the things without being told is its own punishment. That's what it means to be damned. It's just who you are or who you're being, I should say. It's not who you are because who you are is a child of God, right? But it's who you're being is damnable. And I think actually you'd recognize that for yourself, right? You would say, you know, if you would, if you would repent and you would see things the way they are, I should be doing these things. I should be doing good things without anybody telling me to do them. And you would, you would actually see the opposite position. The one that you used to have is damnable, right? It's not commendable. I mean, we can read damnable as the opposite of commendable, right? Those are some thoughts. What, what do you think? You know, if, if we go back to certain philosophers, you know, you study Dante a lot. I don't study Dante nearly as much as you do. Uh, but, but we both know how much Dante changed the conversation about hell and about the Odyssey and about how we view these things, where damned takes on a far more metaphysical distinction than epistemic. Right. And, and what I mean by that is that with, with Dante, there's really this concept of like, burning fiery hell with with little demons and pitchforks and long long red tails right well maybe not maybe not demons and pitchforks and long red tails <laughs> but a lot of our ideas of hell those aside really do come from dante they don't come from the scriptures they don't even come from apocryphal writings necessarily just like a lot of our ideas about paradise come from milton 
But at the same time, you know, I think we can misunderstand Dante too. I, I actually would encourage people to, to read Dante and to study and to see what he's really up to, and especially to go further than through hell, right? Because the journey of Dante goes through hell, right, down uh, all of the levels of hell to come out the other side, on uh, to climb Mount Purgatory, and then to fly through all the, the, the layers of heaven to paradise to be in the presence of God. And so if you stop at the end of Inferno, it's really depressing. And it's actually, it's supposed to be. And so Dante's trying to teach us something about how, well, we'll put it this way, Dante's not damned. He's only, he's only sojourning in hell, or he's passing through so that he can learn what there is to learn there. And there's actually a lot to learn there. But your, but your point is well taken. Yeah, and I think we should, it would do well that my understanding of Dante, and correct me if I'm wrong, is he wasn't making a metaphysical case for this. That this was far more allegorical and far more and abstract isn't the word I'm looking for, but far more speaking of our almost more of our life than even more our post life. Yeah, it's a poem, right? So it's it's aesthetic, right? It's not metaphysic; it's aesthetic, right? And it's I mean, it may have something to teach you about metaphysics, and it's certainly about an understanding. It's it's about human nature, and it's about understanding how harmful it is to ourselves to sin. It's actually harmful to ourselves. And and of course, he may have had the idea that this this medieval idea that somehow is hung on, right? That that sin it's just such a loaded term. What is sin, right? The the word that we're translating sin is hamartia. It's an archery term. It means you're missing the mark. You could be overshooting it, you could be undershooting it. Considering that the word that we're translating as repentance is actually to turn and actually now look in the right direction. It's really just to turn back to God. It's like I've I've turned off the path. I've veered off the path. Maybe I'm looking over here where I should be looking toward God. And by the way, if I'm an archer and I'm not even facing the target, I'm probably going to miss the mark, right? So I think if we can understand these words for what they really mean, then it doesn't look so much like what we see in Dante's Inferno, at least on the face of it, and at the same time, again, I'm not saying that I know that Dante is thinking that way, although that is sort of the you know the medieval way of, of thinking about sin is not the one I've just described. It's maybe more of this, what is it? I actually do, I have a hard time actually, Shiloh, anymore thinking about it the way even I used to. Can you describe it, uh, how it's different from what I'm saying here now? Yeah, you know, especially with... Uh... I can't speak specifically to the medieval, but as far as even no, I mean just Mormon culture nowadays. Yeah, like right. like LDS culture, at least the way that I was raised in, uh, not necessarily my own family nucleus, but in kind of the, the culture of the church, is that sin is the breaking of a commandment. It, it's the failing to live up to a rule. Right. And and so that you know, if you break the rule, that's sin. And then now comes the God's going to zap you part. Right. There it is. That's it. Yeah. And and, and there's a consequence yeah. to the sin, right? Because just like there's a rule or like a law and you break the law, there's a consequence for it. And the, the scri- early scriptural way just looking at it is just different. Just different. <laughs> well, and true enough, if you do, if you miss the mark, then yes, there's a consequence. Well, you didn't make, you didn't hit the mark. And, and, and again, so if we have this view of sin as you've described it, then our view of repentance is also skewed. It means I have to make, I have to do all these steps, right? And the steps can be helpful in guiding you through what a repentance really is. But if you become like a Pharisee and now you're going to confess and you're going to ask for forgiveness and you're going to just check off all the boxes, that's not really what repentance is. Repentance is a change of heart. And all of those things flow naturally from that change of heart. As a matter of fact, this reminds me of something. We have this faith versus works debate with our our fellow Christians, the Protestants, right? The idea is the, the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, they think right, that, that their works can save them. This is the view that the Protestants have. And the Protestants... And, and that may not be true. Exactly. That's that may be a misunderstanding or a mischaracterization of what we believe. But let's look at what they have to offer us that's actually valuable, and that is their belief. Never mind our belief, whether they got it right or wrong. Let's look at their belief. Their belief is that God's grace changes us 
It changes our hearts. This is the the Benson quote that says, the world works from the outside in, the Lord works from the inside out. The world tries to take people out of the slums, the Lord takes the slums out of the people, and then they take themselves out of the slums. So it's, it's kind of in alignment with that Ezra Taft Benson quote. They think, they believe that God's grace changes your heart from the inside and that your actions flow from that new creature. And I think that makes sense. Yes, I think that actually makes far more sense with my experience of God, that great that God's grace is prior to change. It's it's not what comes but because a lot of what Mormon Mormon uh tradition and I'm not gonna say it's Mormon doctrine, but at least the way that the Mormon culture talks about this, is that grace is only capable once the individual has come and has, has qualified for it. Right. You, the works are going to qualify you, whatever they are. Right. Or the repentance process, maybe. Right. Yeah. And so, I, going back to this damned thing, I, I look at this far more, especially when you get into uh, the later section, we're going to talk about the three degrees of glory. I, I look at the three degrees of glory now as far, far more epistemic than I do metaphysic. And and for those who are we're using these words, metaphysic and epistemic, Metaphysic is just what we mean in referring to this is we're talking about reality or like an objective reality or of, of how reality exists. Is this actually a part of reality or versus when we talk about an epistemic point of view is or how is it perceived? How do we have knowledge of it? Maybe this helps. Is, are there three places or are there three experiences? Maybe does that make sense? Right. So metaphysics is about what is real and what is the nature of what is real what's the nature of reality so there are the, there are these three places we think if we think of of the degrees of glory as in a, in a metaphysical way whereas if we think about them epistemically which is about how we know and what and you know how, how we yeah but and that includes how we experience things well then there can be three different experiences without there being three different places Physical places, right? Metaphysical places. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah, that helps a lot. And, and especially I, when I look at a, epistemology and looking at the, the distinction between the three degrees of glory uh, as from an epistemic point of view, especially in going in and bringing about the repentance discussion, Ben and I have talked a lot about that with how repentance is ch- changing to see God differently. You know, that's how it's defined in the LDS Bible Dictionary is that uh, you know, it's a fresh view about God, about ourselves, and about the world around us. And it's this idea that once we are able to follow the beatitude path of letting go of all of the connections that hold us to this temporal world, all of the temporal the temporal things that keep us from our true eternal identities, and we've let those go, and we stand there, we mourn, and then we stand in a place of meekness where we have no more connection to the world, the world has no connection to us then and only then are we truly free. And then we actually belong anywhere. The, the, the world is ours at that point. Yeah. Not, 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 not stroking the kitty cat, right? But you, you put it best, Shiloh. Tell us what's this idea of the world? Be- because this is what's actually promised in the Beatitudes. Well, right. It's that the meek inherit the earth. Right. And so it's like, why do the meek inherit the earth? Well, it's that idea, just like you said, and you said it really well, is that when we belong nowhere... When we've detached ourselves from all of the identities of the world, and we belong nowhere in the world, suddenly we belong everywhere. Yeah, and the world is ours now. And you know, this gets into like Jesus with the whole temptations and and everything like that. But yeah, there's a lot that we can unpack, and we have. In fact, you and I did a, a an episode for Latter Day Contemplation on meekness about this whole thing. That's right. But just to unpack it a little bit, I'll give an example. So if I take on this identity of I am on the on the left or on the right or on the top or on the bottom, I've now cut myself off from, you know, if I took the top, I cut myself off from the bottom. If I took the left, I cut myself off from the right and vice versa. Whereas if I don't have any of those identities, well, I'm at home anywhere and I'm at peace within myself because choosing those sides often brings a lot, brings, uh, takes away my peace and giving up on those choices, right? Choosing to not to choose a side brings me peace and it brings me into peace i can belong anywhere and i can get along with anybody and by the way we ultimately do because look let's say i'm on the left and you're on the right or i'm on the top and you're on the bottom and then let's say your daughter gets cancer god forbid and my daughter gets cancer god forbid now all of a sudden let's say we're not friends in this story but we meet 
and you're on the left and I'm on the right or vice versa. And but your daughter has cancer and my daughter has cancer. That whole left right thing goes out the window. We can relate to each other at the level of my daughter has cancer, right? Yeah. On a human level. On a human level. Yeah. I think that's a great distinction. And I think this is where it gets back into the damned. Because if, if we pick the left and we exclude the right, then we've damned ourselves to the right. Right. Well put. And if we, if we pick the bottom over the top, we've damned ourselves to even knowing what the top is. Right. And, and we do these things and where we pick one thing at the exclusion of other things as, as opposed to this other third way of being able to be connected with all things. We close ourselves off to, the, to other possibilities. We don't see Jesus doing this, right? Right. We see Jesus is able to connect with everyone. And as a matter of fact, he goes to the people that nobody else connects with, right? Who's he, who's he hanging out with? He's having dinner with, with the prostitute and the derelict. The and, tax you know, collector. Right, the tax collector. Thank you. Yeah, the tax collector. Today's tax day when we're recording this, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he goes out and, and even – I love there's a quote from Elder Hunter where he talks about how when the Pharisees and the Sadducees are coming to try to, to hook him on their questions. And they're always trying to ask him these difficult questions, that you know, impossible questions to answer. And how he's right. always getting away from, and Elder Hunter brings up this way of of saying that why why did Christ respond the way that he responded? He didn't actually get into their trap. Why did he respond right. the way that he responded? And Elder Hunter says he did so because he recognized that he came to save them as well. Yes, exactly. Right. How can how can he alienate them? He wants them to come to him, just like everybody else, right? You know, I want to go back a minute to this tax day thing, because once I said that, I realized that we're missing the context. If we think that way, we have our own tax day and we have our own taxes and our own context for that. The context of the tax collector that Jesus is as a, as a Palestinian Jew in, in the, you know, in the first century is having is actually a fellow Jew who's collecting taxes for the occupying Romans who are Right, who are occupying Palestine, who are forcing uh, Ju- the the Jews to to carry their packs as they are, you know, there with their boots on their necks, so to speak. Right? Yeah, that's the context, and he's having dinner with that guy, <laughs> <laughs> the the traitor of the traitor, and he's out there fellowshipping him and bring him because right. because Jesus does not yes. recognize the idea of traitor because he's not beholden to the identities of the world that have constructed the idea of traitor. All he sees is child of God. Yes. That that true exactly. and eternal identity. And he sees that in everyone. And we've got to be able to see that in ourselves and in our fellow man. Which is, as we discussed, is repentance. To see God differently, ourselves and each yes. other differently. Yeah. And I think that's what it means to take upon ourselves the name of Christ. You know, going back over here to this being uh, anxiously engaged in a good cause and taking this back into the metaphysics of the, the metaphysics or epistemology of the three degrees of glory, I'm coming to a place where I, where I see more, I personally see, and I'm just going to put this out there as call it gospel of Shiloh, whatever you want, but it is the idea that the distinctions of the kingdoms of glory, you know, we have this idea that the celestial can visit the terrestrial and celestial or the celestial can visit the, the terrestrial can visit the celestial. And so it's like, I've always wondered, how does that work, work metaphysically? And why would we do that? That's just weird. <laughs> and then once I was able to grasp a hold of the idea that this is, might be all epistemic, that the distinctions here are all about different, the different consciousness about how we perceive things. We've repented and seen God in a pure light to where we, in belonging nowhere, we belong everywhere. And that's why a celestial person can go anywhere. <sighs> That tastes so good. Right. And that's yeah. why someone who's celestial can't go anywhere because they're beholden to their own temporal and, and they, they never let go of the temporal identities. Right. There's no metaphysical boundary. Right. Right. It's they're not prevented in any way, but by themselves, by their own way of seeing reality. That's what we mean by epistemics, right? Or epistemology. It's not reality. It's the way we see reality. Right. The way we understand it whether correctly or incorrectly. So if we don't see things as they really are, well, then we're limited by our own view, by our own way of seeing things. It's not God who's limiting us. And by a a definition that's being damned. 
Yes, that's exactly what I what I meant. Yeah, it's just it's uh, that epistemic distinction there between the kingdoms of uh, of glory was a was a big deal for me when I when that first kind of occurred to me. <laughs> and and I it sounds like that really opened things up for you. It did. It really opened things up. And and that's what epi- that's epistemic, right? That's that's an experience of having a new understanding, right? A repentance process. It was literally a, a repentance exactly. process to be able to have yes. it. Yeah. But so but there was no sin. Ah, but yes there was, right? Because it doesn't you didn't have to break a commandment. You just were seeing things wrong. And and the, your repentance also didn't involve you know confessing, but well there was there was no sin to confess. I mean, I mean okay maybe I don't know what I don't know whether you confessed. Could you confess? Oh Lord, I really, I really didn't see things as they were. I think the next thing I would say is thank you for showing me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for opening my eyes. It's like Enos when he's like, I, "How is this even possible?" Right. I was gonna say he just went through this this process where now he's been like all of this is let go and the weight is gone, and he's like, "How? What? <laughs> what just right. what just happened? How is this even possible?" And then you you start to ask, yeah, that that whole process. Okay. Well, look look what happened to me. Right. So I, can I even remember and explain the opposite view? The idea of you know the way that I used to think of sin. I I, I had to get some help. Right. <laughs> Um, I, I couldn't even, and and it's the same thing with nonviolence. You know, it's it's hard for people to understand a commitment to nonviolence when they don't have one. And this is something that distills upon your soul. You and I have been in this conversation for years, and we didn't have this in the beginning. This is something that that has slowly we, that we've become, in some sense, right? This is a becoming, even though that implies a metaphysical change. But it's a change of heart. And so in some sense, we can say that there's this metaphysical reality to that. Because as our hearts, as our views change, our heart actually changes. But what are we talking about? We're talking about a reversion, really. We're talking about, it's not a conversion, it's a, it's a reversion. right? It's back to the true self. Back to seeing things, to seeing ourselves in, in a right relationship. Righteousness means right relationship. In a right relationship with God and with our fellow man. Yeah, yeah, I you know I think conversion is the correct epistemic word. I think okay. I think and what did you say? What was the word that you you used? I said reversion, and that's because I'm thinking of going from a false view that's a false self view back to a true self view of things as they are. That's why I say reversion. Yeah, if if I were if I were the person like if I were the person experiencing this epistemically, I think the word I would use is conversion because from my egocentric point of view, I feel that I am not coming back to the true self, but I'm I'm moving into a new a new reality I never knew before. But from a me- that's what it feels like. For, yeah, that's what it feels like. But from a like a metaphysical standpoint, when you're like an outside observer looking at someone. Then at that point, it's like a reversion because uh, you're realizing yes. that this person is now becoming aware of what they always already were. Right. And that's only, this is something you can only know after the fact. That's why you say, as, you know, either as a third party observer or looking back on your own experience, you could see it as a reversion. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you there. That's a good distinction. Yeah. I like that a lot. I'm going to, I'm going to put that down and actually write that in my, uh, after, after we're done. So, so moving on, on here, we have, we just have so much. We have to, I'm going to have to kind of skip over this. Okay. So here with verse 31, I wanted to talk about this because this is a major element in talking about the scriptures. And in fact, it, as I've taught gospel doctrine before, as I've taught seminary before, just random conversations, this question comes up a lot, but it's why did the Lord command the people to gather to Missouri? knowing that it was going to fail. And why all this language? <laughs> why all this language? And in fact, Ben and I have actually talked about this quite quite extensively. Why all this language of a God that is actively getting him to go to Zion for all of these blessings, realizing they're never going to get these blessings. They're never going to they're never, they're not going to build it. I have an answer. Go for it. What's your answer? Notice I said an answer, not the answer. Okay. Here's an answer. And I'm going to base this answer on a difference because I know this is the doctrine and covenants and I know this is modern revelation, but if you look at the language and who's speaking, first of all, who's speaking is the God of the old Testament. This is Jehovah, right? And, and if you look at the language, even the language, right, this is what, what we see here is couched in the same, 
Elizabethan English, right? The same, the same King James English, the same English of the King James Bible. And, and this is typical of, this is how Jesus spoke to the people of, you know, of his time on earth, right? He comes to, to Palestine and he talks about, he, he talks to the people that he's living with and among in the, in the language of the Old Testament, right? He's going to quote them and that's what they, that, that's their tradition, right? So now he comes to us and he talks to us in much the same way, right? It's continuing in that tradition from the ancient Jewish tradition through the New Testament tradition into our own tradition, which is a restoration of what came before, right? So, here he comes and he tells us these things, but here's the thing. What is that original context? I want to go back to that original context. In that original context, the promised land, let's just take the promised land as an analogy to Zion. Does that, does that work? We can take that? Sure. Okay. So the promised land in a Greek way of thinking, and that's our way of thinking. Our way of thinking comes from a Greek way of thinking, is an empty space that we are going to occupy and now we're in the promised land, right? That's, pr- that's pretty straightforward. That's really how we think about it. But that's not the Jewish way of thinking about it. That's not, that's not the ancient Israelite way of thinking about it is what I'm really trying to say. The ancient Israelite way of thinking about it, where we think in terms of nouns, the ancient Israelite language and way of thinking thinks in terms of verbs, in terms of action. And so what makes a promised land is a promised people. So the Zion that's being built here is not about a place. It's about a people. And that's why we've come to this idea that Zion is the pure in heart. And so wherever that promised people is, that's the promised land. And wherever that Zion people is, that's Zion. That's an answer. (laughs) Well, that's a better answer than I had. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, I'll go with my answer and I'm going to weave it back into yours to, to make it, uh, to make it more, more coherent. In verse 31, I command and men obey not. I revoke and they receive not the blessing. Then they say in their hearts, this is not the work of the Lord for his promises are not fulfilled, but woe unto such for their reward lurketh beneath and not from above. All right. So then we skip over to verse 44 on the other side of the column. And now verily I say unto you concerning the residue of my elders of my church, the time has not yet come for many years for them to receive their inheritance in this land, except they desire it through the prayer of the faith, only as it shall be appointed unto them of the Lord. For behold, they shall push the people together from the ends of the earth. All right, so tying this back into what you said, because I, I love that so much. You know, as we've ta- as Ben and I have talked about before, is that... This is my own centric self talking about this, and so I'm using my, my own my own sensibilities talking about this. But I have very little tie to place in my life. I, I've moved around a lot. As a child, I moved around a lot. As an adult, my wife and I, bless her heart, she has she has packed up and we've we've moved. Just as a married couple, we've lived, lived in more than 20 places in 15 years of marriage. We've moved a lot. That is a lot. And so my concept of my distinction and even the value that I place on place is is very, very limited. Now, granted, where I live in Bakersfield, uh, I, I feel like I've kind of put down roots. And I, for me, I'm like, I don't want to move anymore. I don't want to go anywhere anymore. Like, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> like, I'm done. So I'm so done. I was like, I just, I'm so done. But Rachel, my wife, she's still in this, let's travel and see the whole world. Let's like, let's sell everything and get a motorhome and travel everywhere. And so we're in kind of two different worlds. <laughs> she, she, she lived in one place her whole life. Now she's like, let's have an adventure. And I'm like, I'm so tired of adventures. And I like, I don't want to do any of that. Right? And so for me, when I look back and I see these people wandering and this whole idea of a promised land, and especially over in, in Israel where there's a lot of conflict right now, and all of the covenants given, I personally, as as a as a tribe of Ephraim, I, I I just I don't want I don't want to move over there. I don't want that piece of land for you know that forever and ever and ever as an inheritance. <laughs> like I look at that and I'm like, that can't be what God had in mind. And so what you said there made beautiful sense because it's not about the place; it's about the people. And God is building the people, and He's trying to build the people. And he gets them to see, he commands them to, to bring them to a place where they see him differently and then they don't. And so they, they don't, right. they don't actualize their own potentiality. 
What, what, th- let, me, let me phrase that differently. They don't actualize what they always already are. They don't perceive it. They don't, uh, beca- they don't realize it. Right. Their reality is not, th- their perception of reality is not in agreement with reality. They don't realize who they are. Yes. And because of that, that's what damns us. And so this is one of those things that it, it doesn't work because we don't realize who and what we already are. But in a way, if we look at the way that the church moved forward as the way that God knew it would, it would, in a way, God was still building his people. It was not about, it had, I look back on meekness and I realize that the meek inherit the earth and for the reasons why the meek inherit the earth. And then to think that God really had in store this particular piece of ground, like I, I, I own my home. And so in a sense, in a legal sense, I can do whatever I want to that bush over there in my, in my front or backyard. But the, but I've sat out there in my yard and I've looked at, I've looked at the plants and they, they grow with or without my permission. Like I'll water them because I enjoy the beauty of it. And if I don't, they'll die. But they don't owe me anything. I don't owe them anything. It's like I, 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 I have a love for them as because just what they are, I have love for it. So I tend it. I take care of it. I cultivate it because it's like a creation. I can't help but want to do that. But to, to I've looked at that and I've seen new leaves grow forward and I've seen I've seen the cycles that it go through every year of these of these things, and I've laughed at myself the idea that I own you. Right. It's like, well, you know, yeah, especially when you know that there are trees that are, I, I saw a tree with my own eyes that has been, and this was, where was this? It's the, it was a, a it's somewhere in Southern Utah where there's this place, Brian, Brian Head's Peak, it's near there. And there's this tree there that's been growing there for 2000 years. I mean, empires have come and gone, Right. <laughs> right. Now, ownership is a good thing that human beings, it's a good construct that human beings have between each other to be, and it has a useful utility. But when you get down to the metaphysics of it, and I go out there and I actually sit down there and I look at that plant and I let it see, and and I just try to observe its beauty for what it, what it, it is. The conversation of I own you, you're mine forever and ever and ever, just doesn't even come into the, that thought process. It's, it's weird for me to even think about this. And so when I think about the Lord giving an inheritance or like, this is yours. And, and by the way, I, ha- I have to kind of walk back a little bit on this because under the whole law of consecration and, and the way they do things, there isn't ownership. It's all stewardship. There isn't even that ownership, but still it's a stewardship forever and ever and ever. This is, this is your piece of land, right? And even then I'm like, thanks, but I just don't think the metaphysics of the land is the, is the, is the thing. I wonder if it helps to understand this if we think back in history and realize that men used to think that they had property in women the same way they might think they have property in a piece of land today. And maybe we need to come into a relationship with the tree or the land like the one that we should have with our wives, where we don't own our wives, we don't own women, and we don't own trees any more than we own women. Yeah. And yet we have a responsibility to each other, and we live in a symbiotic relationship, both with the land and with our fellow men and women, with our wives, with our children, with our neighbors, with our community. This, I think, again, is seeing things as they really are. And I think if we can see things in that way, not in the way of even natural law theorists that but which, by the way, they they always start with this fictitious state of nature, right? It's a, it doesn't exist. It's not God's plan. It's not His creation. It's not the reality of the world we live in. And even they know that they start from their whole theory starts from a place of fiction. You and I know a thing or two about these theories, right? Yeah, we start with uh, this idea of the state of nature. That uh, this come about from, I think Hobbes, right? Hobbes, Leviathan. You know, he's the one who creates this hypothetical state of nature, and, and we base the entire. Well, each one of them has their own. It's true. Yeah, each one of them has their own. I'm, I'm thinking in terms of uh, like a, American political thought, because that's what I studied philosophy in in at BYU, and and so whenever I, I I think about that, I'm like, okay, John Locke's state of nature. No, it came first before. Ho- okay, Hobbes' state of nature, then John Locke, then yeah, I, and then it creates the you know the cosmology, like the the American cosmology from it, all based on from the fictional. The fictional origin story. Right. You know, there's there's a natural law theorist in the Muslim tradition from around 800, 900. Abdul-Jabbar is his name. 
he, you know, Locke, I think where he goes wrong is where he starts talking about, first of all, to think that you own yourself or what is it? What does he say? You own your body, you own yourself. I'm God. I'm God's creature. He owns me. I don't even have the right to take my own life. That's against his commandment, right? So here, Abdul Jabbar says, everything that God created is good. And this is obvious because God is good. And so if he created it, it must be good. And then he says, now, who is it good for? When you say good, good for what? Good for who? And the answer is, it's good for us, for his creatures, because he doesn't need anything. He's self-sufficient. And this is kind of the understanding of what it means to be God, right? And so whatever he has created is good for us. And we can claim it, just like Locke says, but he doesn't then go on to say, if you mix your labor with it and now you it's because you own yourself and you've mixed some of yourself with the land therefore now the land you own the land too what he says is you can claim whatever you need as long as you leave enough for everyone else that's it that's his whole theory in a nutshell yeah it's interesting the way these ideas have evolved and how they come down and then the dnc we toy with a lot of these ideas natural rights come into play you know these these inherent and inalienable rights come into play into the conversation. And so I, I love how we talk so often about these ideas that were formulated by man over over centuries and how they culminated in, in this day and age. And it came into the, the language that Joseph was using and it came into the ideas that they saw God through. And they weren't immune to it. Right. But, but yet we still are able to look at this and to be able to see God pouring through the cracks of man's philosophy. And again, we don't see Jesus look... There may be natural rights. Let's say for the sake of argument, there are. But we don't see Jesus arguing for his natural rights. We see him submitting. We see the Romans, their project is peace through victory. The Pax Romana means we come in as Romans and we say to you, confess that Caesar is Lord. By the way, that was Caesar's title. Caesar was Lord. He was Savior of the world. He was God. He was the son of God. He was God from God. All of those are titles of Caesar before Jesus is born in Palestine. And and if you don't, we're going to kill you. And, And if you do, then we're going to tax you back to the tax collector, right? And so that we can then be able to afford to go do this somewhere else too, right? To the next, to the next town or the next nation, right? And this is not the project of Jesus. As, as you and I know, you know, we, we both, worked on a, a documentary together. We were pr- producing a documentary and we I interviewed John Dominic Crossan who talks about these things and, and explains them in, in his books. It's this idea of peace through justice. And what is justice? Justice is directly related to righteousness, which means being in a right relationship. Putting ourselves in a right relationship with God and with our fellow man. And Jesus is willing to, he's willing to He's not actually fighting for anything, right? He's not willing to fight for it, but he's willing to submit and he's willing to lay down his life for the sake of showing us what it means to be in right relationship with God and with each other. Well, that's a perfect segue. So as we turn here to section 59, we have a a revelation that comes six days after 58, where the Lord says, Wherefore, I give unto them a commandment saying, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy might, mind, and strength. And in the name of Jesus Christ, thou shalt serve him. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thou shalt not steal, neither commit adultery, nor kill, nor anything likened to it. Thou shalt thank the Lord thy God in all things. So in other words, everything that we have has been given us by God. Right? Just as Abdul Jabbar said, otherwise, why would he say, thou shalt thank the Lord thy God? in all these things. And of course, verse 6 is dealing with, again, this right relationship with God and with with our neighbor, and loving God, and in loving our neighbor as as we love ourselves. Not to think, what does that mean? I mean, I don't know that I actually love myself, Shiloh. I'm I'm struggling with that somewhat. And, And therefore, by the way, it's harder for me to demonstrate love to my neighbor. So this is exactly the work that I have to do to build the kingdom of God, which he says is within me, and to put myself in right relationship with God such that I can accept and believe in his love and experience it such that I can then 
I guess pass it on would be one way to put it, right? So that I can then love my neighbor as myself. But another way to look at this is love your neighbor as yourself. This means you're not trying to get one up your neighbor, right? You would actually share as you would rather, as you would like someone to share with you if you were uh, wanting, right? Yeah. But you were going to, but you were going to go, uh, through some more verses here. Well, you know, just going on what, what you had talked about, you know, there's this, I, I, I struggle to ever be able to talk about it, to know how, how to talk about it. But it's, it's this idea that God, it's not that God is, it's not pantheism where, where God is in all things, you know, that all things are God or, or like a panentheism, but it's, it's this idea that we are gods in embryo, right? That, that's a very famous phrase within, within uh, Mormon cultural thought. And, you know, we've talked about that. That's reached into some of our manuals. God's in embryo. And we talk about that in church in, in this way that, you know, we're not like our heavenly parents yet, but we're learning how to become like, but yet we still carry the DNA of the gods, as it were. And in that, even through the temple, even through the temple, uh, rituals and the temple story and, and the drama of the temple from baptism to sealing is the idea that we enter into the same action of the gods through creation. The, the, the culmination of our sealing, I, I wrote a paper on it, and Christopher, you helped, uh, you helped review it a little bit for me, um, but it's this idea of that the temple sealing is the divine aesthetic, creation, that God, what God creates is the beautiful. And that as we enter into that relationship with God of creating ourselves, and we talk about this most dominantly in terms of procreating our species of having children, but this comes into everything. That the, the creativeness that we have as the human beings, this is really just the divinity within ourselves expressing itself, right? We, yes. you, you, don't, you don't see other animal species going out and creating works of art, right, for aesthetics, no, not at all. Nor, nor do they care what color the walls of their abodes are. Right. <laughs> we have an opinion about these things. This color of wall does not match this color of floor. We're the only animal that thinks this. Right. And so we have this, this way of looking at things where we very much carry the DNA of God already. In doing that, it's this recognition that do we truly love, that, that by loving God is to love ourselves. Because to truly love ourselves is to recognize the God within. We cannot recognize the God without without recognizing the God within. And once that exactly. once that process has happened, we cannot help but see the God from within all things and all human beings. Well, we're made in the image of God. Now, this is something that we recently in the Latter Day Contemplation podcast, in talking about. Blessed are the pure in heart, the beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This is exactly what we talked about. The idea that you are created in the image of God. That image of God is at your core. You may have false identities, and this is why the, the beatitudes begin with the, with the stripping off of these false identities, right? You have to look inside you, and you have to be able to see. You have to be able to polish the pure in heart, right? You have to be able to polish the mirror of the heart such that it accurately reflects the image of God within you. Yeah, that and it goes back to my, you know, like my favorite quote on uh, from Thomas Merton, right? And he talks about how so much depends upon our view of God that it usually ends up being that our view of God, well, I'll, I'll just go ahead and read it. He says, so much depends on our idea of God, yet no idea of God, however pure and perfect, is adequate to express him as he really is. Our idea of God tells us, therefore, more about ourselves than about him. We create God in our image, and at the same time, we create ourselves in the image that we create God. We have to be able to see God accurately. Yep. And that really does take purifying our hearts. It really does take polishing that mirror. Yeah. It's the Voltaire quote that, in the beginning, God created man in his own image. And man being a gentleman, has it tried to repay the favor ever since? Yes. <laughs> That's such a great quote. It's just we we project our humanity, our human foibles, and our own egos onto the idea of God, and then we live into that. And if we don't, if we haven't recognized to see the love of God within, we're not going to be able to project to see the love of God without. 
And we have to remember that we do not believe in Scripture as dictated by God. That, that this isn't something that God is dictating the words. God is, is expressing himself. He's revealing himself in our own minds, in our own, and when I say mind, I mean in our, in our intellect, which is not the ratiocinative part of our mind that we think of today when we think of the intellect. That's the wrong idea. The, the intellect is the one that has direct access to God, the one that has experience of God, not rational arguments uh, for God's existence or something like that, right? This, this direct experience of God. And so that, that's beyond words. That's ineffable. And so he has this experience, and he has to put it in his own terms, and he has to struggle with it. And we see Joseph Smith even in giving account of his first vision. Well, he gives accounts, not one, but several. How do you put this in words? And so the words are his. And as you've already pointed out uh, earlier in this discussion, they're colored by all of the ideas that we have come up with of men. This is maybe one way of thinking about the philosophies of men mingled with scripture. So in section 59, going on what you said, Christopher, in section 59, we have a few more things that we, we could we could talk about. The Sabbath day is talked about pretty extensively. It's a beautiful, beautiful verses there from 9 through 16. They talk about the Lord giving herbs and plants and things for our benefit and for us to eat in the season thereof, and it's been and that's beautiful. But I wanted to read verses eighteen in conjunction with verse twenty one, where it, okay. where it says, "Thou shalt offer a sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in righteousness, even that of a broken heart and a contrite spirit." And then verse twenty one, and in nothing doth man offend to God, or against none is his wrath kindled, save those who confess not his hand in all things. And obey not his commandments. Okay, so that's eight and twenty-one. That's eight right? and twenty-one. Okay, right. so the idea of sacrifice. You know, I, I think I, the sacrifice. I, I've really tried to wrap my mind around this over the last several years, and and I don't believe there's any objective sacrifice. Everything, all sacrifice is subjective. What we sacrifice has to be subjective to the individual, because what you sacrifice, what you give up is going to be different than me. <laughs> just, just the We have different value preferences, right? Is sacrificing necessarily giving things up? And I'm not saying it's not. It's But what, what do we mean by sacrifice? This comes from the Latin, sacros facere, to make sacred. Is there necessarily giving something up? No, not necessarily. But there is the idea that you make something sacred by giving up something of lesser value for something of greater value. That's one possibility. But it's not the only possible understanding of what it means to sacrifice. This is true. I mean, you you could think of a sacrifice as back to polishing the mirror, right? It's to make holy. It's to purify your heart. That's sacrifice. And at the same time, there may be things that you have to give up of lesser value than the value that you have of seeing God, of that beatific vision. Uh, maybe I can't see God if my heart is polluted by other thoughts that are lesser, that are not, that are not worthy of my, of my actual, again, that imago dei within me, that image of God. If I'm beholden to the desires of the flesh, doesn't that get in the way of me seeing myself as who I am and of seeing God as who he is and seeing of myself in the right relationship with God? This is what it means to be righteous. It means to be in a right relationship. Again, it's it, we can take this term righteousness the same way we take sin and we obfuscate it by, once again, I just have a hard time even to, how do I even talk about that? I, I'm well familiar with the, I know the way I used to think about it, but I don't know how to talk about it because I don't think it's really a thing. Yeah. It becomes this, it becomes this nebulous, oh, sin. We all know what sin is. We know what righteousness is, but do we really? I don't think we do. I think we misunderstand what these things really mean. I think to be able to make it palatable to to the masses in a way that everyone can kind of come in from having absolutely no understanding, it's looking at sin as the breaking of a commandment is an easy way to frame the narrative. But sure. but to be able to break actually transcend something that is more more than just that, right? 
And that's it. That's the key. It's transcend that. It's not that it's not true. I mean, I just gave an example of how maybe if I, if I'm beholden to my lusts, you know, whether of the, whether of the stomach or of the genitals, you know, these are kind of the two, um, the, the two biggest problems that we might have in terms of desires. But the point is, in, in general, if I don't control my desires, my desires are going to control me. And that's not godly, whatever the desires are. And so you can see where the idea of breaking a commandment and being in sin can be understood in the traditional way, but it doesn't go far enough. It doesn't really explain things out, right? We have to explain, fully explain things out. And that's what I'm trying to do here is just to fully explain things out such that we understand what we're really saying so that we can actually purify our hearts and see God. And, and yes, we can do it. Of course, it makes, it helps to take those steps to give up the things, right? That, that idea of sacrifice, to give up the things, those desires of the flesh, perhaps, uh, other things that we could give up. And, and we can do those things and that's moving in the right direction. But just an outward action isn't enough. We have to have the right intent and we have to understand what we're doing. And this is where I think, you know, there's, there's always this esoteric, exoteric distinction. And the Gnostics, they thought just knowing things would be enough. There, there, there's overshooting and undershooting the mark, and I, I don't know which one would be which, but they're doing one, and those who are checking off the list are doing the other. And we have to come in the middle and understand that we need both the outward and the inner experience, the esoteric and the exoteric, the inner and the outer. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that distinction. Because when when we... <laughs> That idea of, of sacrifice, of just giving something up for something greater, I, again, I think that's that functions great with sin as the breaking of a commandment um, I, on, on that level. But to make sacred is, is a, a discussion that is so deep and complex that the simple definition of giving up something for something greater doesn't even begin to inc- incorporate even a, a fraction of the conversation. Well, it's not even the main sense, right? The main sense is to make holy. Right. That's just one way that you could do that, and even that has to be understood correctly. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And this is why uh, this is why we can't keep the podcast to an hour and a half, right? <laughs> <laughs> we try, man. I we try. We're we try so much. But in verse twenty-one, so Christopher, do you think God is offended by anything? Is God offended? Well, again, what do we mean? What does it mean God is offended? Here's one way to think about it. This is only one way that's different from, I think, what is the generally understood way of thinking about it, okay? So I'd like to do these exercises, you know, of thinking about things. How else can I understand this, right? Is there more than one way to understand this? Well, it's been said that we are in the image of God. It's been said that we are gods and embryos. We're offending ourselves. How about that? That's one answer. And what does that even mean? What does it mean to offend ourselves? I mean, the point is that we're not realizing who we are. And I know you got this already, but I just want to emphasize, realize. I'm, I'm choosing this word carefully, right? It's to become real, right? to, to actually realize what actually is to come into alignment with the reality of our divine nature and the relationship that God is already, not wants to have with us. Just knock on the door and he's there. He's there. He's already there. We. What's this door? Does there have to be a door? Remember, I t- we talked earlier about we're the ones who put up the boundaries. We're the ones who installed the door and the wall. God is already in a relationship with us. We have to become aware of it. We have to realize that relationship. Yeah, I think that's one of the the things about the culture that has misunderstood and, and drastically misinterpreted these scriptures because they've led to an understanding of a very small God. A God that is very weak and offended. Because, you know, for instance, certain scriptures for that say that God cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. And I, while I understand a portion of that, how that's typically subconsciously understood is that I'm a sinful person and there's things about me that God will never, will never look upon. There's entire aspects of me that God will never you know, look upon friendly and 
in kindness with or as or as, as if there were seen. anything God can't see. Right. Or this right. idea that uh, that we, we have, and I grew up with this all the time in church lessons, lessons about things that sh- scare the spirit away and things that invite the spirit to come. The spirit has to run away from us. I know. And, and, and that never- it's, it's scared of us. It's offended. And by the way, how does it- how, how do we how do we reconcile that with Jesus having dinner with the, the the cohorts that we mentioned earlier? That's when we need him. He's he's there when we need him. He's the the the, the people who are well don't need a physician. He's the physician of the soul for those who need him, those who are in sin. He wants us to bring us into that right relationship with him. You know, and and the whole thing that God does not dwell in unholy temples. Well, the fact is, is that in this life, we can talk about the sacred and the profane from kind of a an Eliade perspective all we want, and we can, we can talk about making the sacred versus making the profane, the profane being the common, the sacred being set apart from the common, and, and all the different ways that this has. But the fact is, is that there's going to be no real part of my life where I'm going to become sacred like my father in heaven. Or holy like my father in heaven. So then at that point, it becomes a, a discussion of degrees. And then at that point is like, well, how many, how many good holiness, how many holy credits do I need to have in my soul to be able to cross the, the threshold to where God will then be able to dwell with me? Because I, I'm, I've reached the part of holiness that's just enough for him to dwell with me. Otherwise, I'm not. These kinds of concepts and these absolute terms that we think about just don't make any sense when we really start to analyze them. Right. We just read last night that we're all sinners. and Not last night, sorry, last week. We just read last week that we're all sinners. All of us. All fall short of the glory of God. And by the way, um, I, I see exactly what you're doing with this analogy, and that makes perfect sense. At the same time, remember that neither is God perfect in that way that we have misinterpreted perfect. In that way that we think that to be perfect is, which by the way, really, it means to be whole, right? That what we're talking about is being whole. And to be whole isn't to reach some ceiling or some goal, some telos, right? This is the Greek way of thinking about it again. To be perfect is to act in a perfect way, to act in a whole way, to be in a whole, to be a whole human being in a right relationship with God and with our fellow man. Once again, righteousness, right? this justice. And this is the project of Jesus, as opposed to the project of Rome I mentioned earlier, is peace through justice, putting everything in its proper place. No, I think that's a perfect uh, segue here to this last verse. All right. Verse 23, but learn that he who doeth the works of righteousness shall receive his reward, even peace in this world and eternal life in the world to come. Amen. So that when we realize that correct way of being with each other, of being with ourselves, of being with God, it's an awareness of what already exists. You know, Ben and I have talked about quite a bit over the last uh, few episodes about kind of the problematic nature of metaphysical becoming that somehow metaphysically we're becoming something else. And so it's it's one of those things like how do we how do we know when we finally get there? Well there is no there. We just covered that, right? Right. We believe in eternal progression for for ourselves and for God. And once again, we are God. We're God's an embryo. We're to become one with the Father, as Jesus says. He did. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so look at this. It says righteousness if you're righteous, you shall receive reward. It's so tempting to read that in a transactional way. But there's not a transaction. Righteousness is its own reward. That's what it's saying. Righteousness means reward. And it means peace in this world and eternal life in the world to come. What more could we ask for? A reward? It is the reward. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I don't have anything more to say to that. That's a okay. perfect way to do it. Well, awesome. Well, thank you everybody for listening and for uh, for sticking around for the for this. And Christopher, you'll be back with us next week as we uh, as we tackle this one more time. I look forward and, to it uh, and go from there. But uh, thank you again for being with us. And until then, I'm Shiloh Logan. And I'm Christopher Hurtado. Thanks for listening.